Awesome. Well, thanks for that introduction, James. Uh, my name is Quinn Martin. I'm an audit principal at Davidson Company, uh, Chartered Professional Accountants. We've changed over recently from the CA um, to CPA to follow the states in that regard. Uh, just a little background on Davidson and Company. We are a mid-size public practice firm here in Vancouver. Um, we specialize in audits of both public and private entities. Uh, we also have a Canadian and U.S. tax compliance department. And we also have a uh, valuation department as well. A lot of you private comp or a lot of people working with private companies will attest to the fact that uh, quite often there's intangible or other assets that need specific consideration when trying to identify a fair value in the going public process, so the valuation department uh, becomes quite integral in that regard. Um, there's a couple things that I'm going to be talking about today, a couple topics, and let's see if I can use this thing. Oh. All right, well, let's start with the easy one. What an audit accomplishes. So essentially, I'm sure many of you know this, but a, a financial statement audit is completed to verify the accuracy and the completeness of a company's financial information. Um, essentially, financial statements as a whole contain the statement portion and then the supplemental note disclosure. And during the audit process, we essentially gain comfort on the accuracy and completeness of all of the numbers and all of the qualitative disclosures that supplement the underlying numbers. Um, as pointed out, uh, previously there, audited financial statements are required for inclusion in filing statements and uh, listing applications and any other offering documents for the most part. So it is something that you want to make sure that is lined up before uh, you, you finalize your listing application there with the CSE. Um, audited financial information is also commonly included in pro forma financial information that might be required to supplement offering docs or listing statements. So that's another outside consideration. Uh, the big thing as well is that it just gives management and owners of a company uh, the ability to verify the accuracy of their financial information so that when you go to meetings with bankers or you go to meetings with the regulators or prospective investors, you have something that has an audit opinion attached to it. So the financial information contained within those statements have just an additional level of comfort from anyone using them in making investment decisions. The next topic I want to chat about has probably got the most meat out of all the topics here. It's basics of the audit process. So um, what I should mention at this point in time is, as well is in the going public process, uh, the auditor's involvement is a little different than say working with your lawyers at Macmillan there. Uh, we, are, we approach every audit with an objective state of mind, so the financial statement audit itself is completed on a standalone basis. There's a specific engagement letter for that audit as a whole. Our association with the actual listing application or other offering document is a separate standalone engagement, and I'll talk about briefly why, why we're associated with the document in a, in a uh, separate section of this speech here, uh, but just put that caveat out there. Uh, we're not kind of handy, holding your hand along the entire process. We're in there to do the audit, and then we're in there for the association standpoint as well. So we'll talk about that briefly in a bit. So basics of the audit process. Essentially, every audit starts with a meeting and a few initial letters. Those letters being, as, as just briefly mentioned there, the engagement letter, which confirms the timing, the reporting requirements, billing levels, et cetera. Um, an independence letter, because of course we need to be independent of the, independent of the company on, on which we'll ultimately be issuing our audit opinion. And then an initial letter to either the board of directors or if your company has already set up an audit committee, it'll be addressed to them. Essentially what that one does is it confirms our audit approach, uh, significant risks that were identified the way around the, during the planning process, and then also uh, just overall um, considerations surrounding um, the actual audit and how it's going to be completed on a full scale. Uh, the next thing that's probably worthwhile pointing out is I know a lot of private companies uh, will be incorporated years, years or years ago, say five years ago. Um, you're required to have two years worth of financial information in your audited financial statements. Does that necessarily mean that you have to go back and audit and opine on five years worth of financial information from incorporation through to date? Uh, the simple answer is no. In that regard, what we do is we do uh, build up auditing on your balance sheet figures. 
so that we can get to January 1st, you know, we'll say a December year, and January 1st of the prior year, because we'll be opining on the prior year and the current year. So it's just build up procedures where we have to gain an understanding and a, and a level of comfort on those opening balances so that ultimately that can drive our audit opinion at the end of the day. Okay, getting back to the audit approach. Um, typically under Canadian auditing standards, there's a twofold approach. Uh, the, the more common approach is what's called a substantive audit approach, where we really rely on uh, just kind of gaining an understanding of the company's controls in place, but we really push down to substantive audit testing, which involves looking at underlying documentation to ascertain the uh, accuracy, completeness, and existence of the, of the accounting transactions. There is um, internal control reliance audits that are completed as well, but I'm going to assume that none of the companies that we'd be cons considering in this course today are, um, are large enough to have a proper control structure with segregation of duties to really support our full reliance on internal controls. You need to have a lot of employees on staff, you need to have documented processes, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to obtain unless you have the, the funding and the size to support it. So, when it comes to a substantive audit procedure, again, I, uh, the reliance, of course, would be on having all of the relevant support to review on our end so that we can build our audit file. It'll also rely on external confirmations where um, we actually get confirmations with outside suppliers and customers to confirm any balances owing at year end, transaction cycles, um, asset ownership. If it's an exploration play, we've got to make sure that you have title to the project that you say you hold title to things of that nature. So really the substantive audit is just us uh, getting really into the thick of things with uh, management prepared documentation and external support. When it comes to actually completing the, office, or the audit itself, um, the majority of our audits are completed out at co companies' offices. If there's kind of, if, if you just incorporated recently and there's only, you know, three months worth of financial information through to your, your, your chosen year end, uh, quite often we'll do box audits in-house where you just drop off all of the underlying documents and we can just do it from, from our, the comfort of our own desk, so to speak. Um, when it comes to the composition of the audit team, uh, every audit requires two partners to be involved, that being a lead and a concurring partner. Um, the person actually running the job will be either a principal or a manager and then we'll have staff accountants involved as well. And when it comes to the duration of the audit, of course that depends on the quality of the accounting records, um, the ability for the company to provide complete set of records, um, also to a certain extent the sophistication of the individuals involved in the accounting and financial reporting process is, is integral, um, and then other variables such as the complexity of certain accounting transactions that were entered into during the period. I'll briefly talk, talk about what happens during the audit when we find um, a, an, an issue, an adjustment, an adjustment that would need to be reflected in the financial information of a company. So um, a common misconception for people not fully understanding the audit process is, is the fact that we don't audit absolutely every transaction for the year. We, we work within the scope of materiality and in its simplest definition, materiality is defined as the threshold above which missing or incorrect information in financial statements is considered to have an impact on the decision making of users. So ultimately, how much can these numbers be out on the financial statements where somebody would really second, uh, have a second thought about investing in the company? So we do work within this scope of materiality. We um, substantively uh, select a number of samples to review. We don't audit every little thing. If it's, if it's below scope, we usually pass on it right out of the gates. If we do come across an audit adjustment that we need to discuss, um, we do communicate it with management kind of in a real-time basis. We are required to gain management's um, understanding of the entry as well as their approval before it can be posted through as an approved adjustment. Um, there are certain adjustments that are a little bit more contentious in nature that if they're below materiality level we can leave those unadjusted as well but that's kind of a real time and it's specific to some of the qualitative factors that are surrounding the adjustment that's been identified. So the long and the short of it, you don't have to make every adjustment the auditor identifies along the way. Um, we do have room for leaving them unadjusted and in a supplementary schedule for carry forward purposes. Once the audit's been completed and we've verified the numbers and we're satisfied that we've got copies of all underlying agreements and contracts in place, at that point we'll turn our attention to the financial statements. 
Um, again, as I alluded to before, uh, the first four or five pages of the financials are kind of more the quantitative analysis of the statements themselves. The supplementary notes provide all of the qualitative assessments that are really integral to driving the accounting transactions for the period. Um, so our commentary will reflect, uh, will, will often reflect uh, gaining an understanding around some of the note disclosures that really drive some of the company's commitments and asset bases. So once we provided the financial statement comments, typically the edits are made on the client side of things. They'll send back a revised set and then we can start thinking about completion matters. So an audit is essentially completed when all of the financial statement adjustments have been reflected through and, um, and there's little to, little to no comments left uh, from the auditor's perspective. Uh, again, the, if a company has an audit committee assigned, it's, it's usually the case where they'll hold a formal audit committee meeting and the audit committee meeting will essentially walk through the financial information so everybody's had a chance to, for their last, uh, their last say on particular issues and then suggest the approval or recommend the approval by the company's board, which ultimately has the responsibility for approving the financial statements uh, immediately prior to completion. Uh, on completion, there's a couple easy letters uh, that are finalized. We have a management representation letter that's signed off by the CEO and the CFO, and that essentially just uh, allows us to, it's kind of a CYA moment, it allows us to ensure that management has represented they provided everything we needed to do in order to complete our audit. And then the final board or audit committee letter confirms our audit findings. It, uh, again, it goes back on talking about significant risks and how they were addressed during the audit, difficulties encountered, issues encountered, et cetera. Another common thing that happens at the completion level of an audit is during the audit committee meeting, uh, there's an opportunity for the audit committee to have an in-camera session with the auditors where they can ask us specific questions in respect to how management has performed during the period. Um, and then ultimately we obtain support from the board uh, for the approval of the statements and we're good to go. You get an audit opinion that accompanies your financial statements and that can of course be included in your listing statement or your other offering document. The next topic is how to prepare for an audit. One of the, one of the first things you want to do right out of the gate is ensure that your current accounting records are compliant with International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS. That's what we adhere to here in Canada. Um, quite often you'll find that uh, accounting treatment for something under IFRS could sway different, or could sway in some, in some manner from private company accounting rules. So you just, you'll just want to make sure that you have preliminary discussions and try to identify any of those areas that would require retrospective adjustment in order to conform to IFRS standards. Um, this is a discussion that can be held right out of the gates with the auditor. Just bring your uh, accounting records in in whatever fashion they may be, an Excel file or a, um, I know that certain of the accounting softwares actually will provide you with basic financial statements, a, a balance sheet and an income statement that we can look at and try to um, identify right out of the gates any reconciling items. Um, draft financial statements, of course, uh, are, are integral to getting started. Um, there's lots of good templates out there, your auditor, your lawyer, anybody can really provide one uh, for you get to, to get started in drafting them up and, and start thinking about the note disclosures that will be relevant to your statements. And then of course the most important one from an auditor's perspective is just working papers to really build up your asset, liability, equity account, continuities to the current periods presented. Um, you know, without those we really can't do anything because that gives you a bit of a timeline and an idea as to how things uh, build up from cradle to grave here. Other preparation considerations are just making sure you have all of your relevant financial records. Banking information, invoices, contracts, agreements, you know, these are all going to be required during the audit process. So you might as well try to gather all that stuff and have a complete uh, set of records that you can provide right out of the gates. This will also help ensure that the audit goes as efficiently and effectively as possible, which uh, ultimately will help to reduce your audit fee at the end of the day. Um, gathering external support from people like your transfer agent, if you're already using, say, computer share or something, uh, for a transfer agent, they'll be able to confirm the number of uh, equity instruments you have outstanding, and of course that will help uh, ensure the numbers are compliant before coming across our desks. Um, and then ensure the completeness of any board resolutions or minutes. Um, that's also a really important process. 
especially as you're considering going public. There's probably a lot of important board meetings. Just making sure that those are minuted up and any resolutions are formally documented and either kept with the lawyer or, or provided to us in advance of the audit being um, started is the, you know, that's, that's the recommendation from our end for sure. Uh, a lot of the stuff that gets mentioned in those meetings is going to be integral to the, uh, the accounting considerations made during the audit process. You'll also want to ensure that your accounting staff are available. Uh, there's nothing worse than starting an audit and uh, somebody in integral to the whole process leaves on vacation for three weeks and you have all these questions and you're just left spinning your wheels for a while. And uh, you'll, you'll want to set a timeline for your board meeting to approve the financials just to make sure that all of the timing expectations are being adhered to. And then uh, you, you'll, you'll want to be transparent pretty much. Any complex or contentious matters or issues that you really don't know how to deal with, bring those up as early as possible with your auditor. Um, it's always better to discuss these things in advance so that we can kind of come to a conclusion on the most appropriate treatment. And it also reflects more positively on the accounting staff and the CFO of the company because we can post it through as a management prepared entry as opposed to an adjustment identified during the audit process itself. So again, even before the audit starts, we can talk about any accounting matters that might, uh, that might drive a change from current presentation. Okay, auditor's involvement with a listing statement or other offering document. So, um, as mentioned before, uh, auditors are required to be involved with listing statements, other offering documents that are publicly filed, and it's for two main reasons. The first reason is we review the content to ensure that there's no inconsistencies with financial statement information and disclosures. Quite often you'll come across um, an agreement that's referenced in there, it's contractual, and, but wasn't picked up in the, in the draft, current draft of the financial statements. So that'll be an identification matter, then we'll want to make sure that we follow through and make sure that the financial statements basically run parallel to the disclosures within the listing statement. The other reason is because ultimately at the end of the day, our audit opinion is going to be included in these audited financial statements. They're going to accompany, as probably as an appendix, this listing statement or other offering document. Essentially, our audit opinion is being reproduced in that capacity. So the requirement under Canadian auditing standards is we have familiarity, we review it, and we have involvement along the way, ultimately, so that we can issue our consent to its inclusion in your listing document. Um, Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will often facilitate the preparation of pro forma financial information and many of these pro forma adjustments that ultimately give effect to what the reporting issuer will look like on a go forward basis will be reflected in these offering documents and, um, and certain of the footnotes within the financial statements as a whole. So just keeping your auditor involved um, every step of the way, but understanding that it's two separate engagements for the audit of the financial statements and to be s separately engaged for our involvement with the listing statement or the other offering document, that's kind of the important notion to take out of all of that. Um. So that's pretty much it for, uh, for, for the main topics of, of discussion there. A few closing remarks, you know, the audit process is not as painful if it's planned and it's performed appropriately. Um, you know, the earlier you start talking with your auditor, uh, the easier the process will be in the in it's it's actually a pretty easy process if you provide all of the information up front I don't think anyone thinks it's too overly cumbersome um, involvement of management is integral to the process as a whole and preparedness is important especially as it helps support a reduced audit fee in most cases that's pretty much it I think if, can we hit play on that if you don't mind it's I told the marketing gal we'd put this thing up for you guys really quick so what makes up the go-to auditor is our experience. We've been around since 1984 doing public companies in Canada. Some of the industries that we perform audit in are manufacturing, technology, film, renewable energy, educational institutions, and junior mining and producing mining companies. We do audits all around the world. We have Nexia offices in over 120 countries. We also attend client operations overseas. Working with Nexia, it allows us to have a presence and a local business expertise wherever we are. And we use the same teams because they know the company. Our experience has allowed us to understand deeply what the client needs. Whenever you're passionate about anything, you just do a better job at it so we can bring that expertise to our clients. 